Hello, my name is Lisa McNeil and I'm a member of staff in the School of Ocean and Earth Science here in Southampton. One of the things that I work on in my research is working on subduction zones. I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the methods that we use to measure and monitor them and what we've understood about the processes occurring at them. And hopefully it will be something new for you um, on top of your studies in school. So this is an area that quite a lot of us, um, quite a large group here in Southampton, are working on. So it's something that you would hear about if you would come here and study. So you and, and we um, know that earthquakes around the world are actually marking the boundaries between the tectonic plates. And we can see that on this map here. The subduction zones are where the largest earthquakes occur. And they're also where the deepest earthquakes occur. So you can see these with the blue and yellow dots here. So these are where the subduction zones are located. So they're around the Pacific Ocean, but also uh, others located in the Indian Ocean, Mediterranean and parts of the Atlantic. This is what a cross section of a subduction zone would look like if we were to image beneath the seafloor. So a subduction zone is where one tectonic plate is going underneath another. And the boundary between those plates is marked by the red line that you can see here. And this is the plate boundary fault. And it's the movement on this that generates these really large earthquakes and ultimately the tsunami. And it goes from the trench, which you can see on the right, which is where the two plates meet, and extends all the way and in fact beyond where the volcanic arc is located. So there are other hazards here as well as earthquakes and tsunamis. So why are earthquakes at subduction zones the biggest? Well, earthquakes occur in the part of the crust that is cool enough, as in cold enough, for rocks to break brittly. Now, temperature increases with depth in the Earth, and it's only in the upper tens of kilometres that we can have this brittle kind of behaviour. The subduction zone fault between the two plates, which is the red line here, is dipping at a really quite shallow angle. In fact, it's quite sort of squashed and exaggerated here, and in places it's pretty close to horizontal. And so what that means is you end up with a large area of the subduction zone fault sitting within this upper shallow brittle zone. And the larger of the area that of the fault that can move, the larger the earthquake. Hence why these are the largest earthquakes that we have on Earth. So what sort of methods can we use? Well, there's a whole range. Um, and really what we're trying to do is image um, and reach materials deep beneath the seafloor and then have uh, monitoring techniques that we can use over a period of tens of years and ultimately uh, longer if possible. So this is just showing you an example of that. Uh, this is a, a scientific drill ship called the Chikyu, which is Japanese. And here it is sailing uh, in front of Mount Fuji in Japan. So the first thing that we need to do is image at the seafloor and below the seafloor. And we use geophysics to do that. So we use acoustic uh, techniques, uh, seismic techniques. Um, and this allows us to reconstruct what the layers of sediments and rocks and the faults look like beneath the seafloor. So we can see an example of this here from the Nankai subduction zone in Japan. And this is a location where there's been a really major project for the last 20 years or so, uh, where there's an attempt to try to both image and to sample the faults that are generating these large earthquakes. So the sampling process takes place through drilling. This is where we drill large boreholes or deep boreholes beneath the seafloor, and then we can actually reach, um, in particular, the fault zones that are generating the earthquakes. So that's usually our first step is the imaging part of it. And then, as I said before, we can also use scientific ocean drilling. So here's that Chikyu drill ship that I mentioned from Japan. This ship is more than 200 metres long. And um, so I've had the privilege of sailing on this ship a couple of times. And it, although it's enormous, there's not a lot of space because basically every part of the, the ship is used um, and taken up by equipment. So we use this to drill boreholes that could be hundreds of metres to kilometres beneath, beneath the seafloor. And we can take back um, cores from within that borehole and hopefully a, a relatively continuous sequence of those sediments and rocks. And we can also put instruments down the borehole and we can use those to measure the physical and the electrical properties of the rocks and the sediments and the faults as well. In addition, we can also put in instruments and take in situ measurements. So, for example, we might want to measure the pressure or the temperature within these fault zones. And so you've got an example of an instrument like that on the right. We can also use some techniques onshore. Um, so one uh, method that's really quite important is to try and work out how fast uh, parts of the Earth's surface are moving and moving relative to each other. 
So we use GPS for that. So you all know GPS from your sat nav in your car or from your phone. But it's a technique that's used um, scientifically and pretty widespread in earth science. And it's more precise and more accurate. But we basically have a number of stations uh, dotted around the area. And then they're constantly measuring their relative position to each other. And we can put that together and measure long term motion of different parts of the Earth's surface, but also over a short term, as in what happened during an earthquake. And so the map on the right is showing you um, some of the data from GPS that was taken during the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake that occurred um, in Sumatra and further north. So the arrows that you can see, the coloured green and red arrows, are showing you how much movement there was, particularly of places like Thailand and Malaysia, um, to the west after the earthquake or during the earthquake. And that was my cat. I apologise. So we can do something similar to that on the seafloor, but we have to use a different technique. So um, making those sorts of measurements is possible by using acoustics. So we can put instruments on the seafloor and again measure their distance by measuring travel time of a signal between them. So that technique is a little bit more um, in its infancy, um, but it's moving closer to becoming more um, mainstream. We can also uh, make some measurements over a longer time period beneath the seafloor as well. So in addition to seafloor measurements and the sort of direct in situ measurements we make, we can also put instruments down in the borehole and leave them there for a number of years. So we can measure things like pressure and temperature, but we can also put uh, seismometers down those boreholes and measure for earthquakes um, directly. And it's a much less noisy, a much more quiet environment down there in the borehole than on the seafloor. So this is a whole range of techniques that we have available to us. There are obviously others. Um, let's have a look at an example and see how some of those techniques have been used and also how some new ones are being introduced. So you probably remember the Japan earthquake in March 2011, known scientifically as the Toku Oki earthquake. This was a really important earthquake. It was obviously devastating in terms of loss of life and impact um, on the economy in Japan and worldwide. But it was also important record breaking earthquake. First of all, the fault slipped all the way pretty much to the oceanic trench. Now, that's pretty unusual and we didn't really expect that. Um, so it tells us something about the properties of the fault materials that we didn't really understand before. And then the second part is how much the fault slipped. So it moved up to about 50 to 80 metres, so nearly 100 metres. And I always think of this as running 100 metres. I haven't done that fast for a long time. But if you think about that in your mind and how far that is, and then picture a fault, a tectonic fault, moving that amount in a matter of seconds in one location. It's quite incredible to think about. This was the largest slip ever recorded on a single fault in a single earthquake. We knew that these sorts of faults could move tens of metres, but to move merely 100 metres was probably a little bit beyond what we were thinking. So there were two methods that we used um, during this earthquake or before and after this earthquake that hadn't been used before. And I think at least one of them is going to become much more widespread. First of all, uh, they used uh, measurements of the seafloor water depth or topography or bathymetry um, before and after the earthquake to work out how much it had moved. So basically, you would take a transect of the seafloor depth before and after, subtract one from the other. Um, and ultimately, how much the seafloor moves is a function of how much the fault has moved. And they were able to use this to confirm this amount of more than 50 metres on the fault in the outer part near the trench. This was only really possible here because the slip was so large. So basically the, the data are fairly noisy um, and you've got to get to a slip of a certain amount before you'd actually be able to resolve it. Another method that was used here really fortuitously because the instruments happened to be on the seafloor at the time, but could be used much more widespread was using uh, pressure gauges. So these were instruments sitting on the seafloor and they're measuring the pressure at the seafloor, which is basically a function of the height of the water column overlying them. Now, as a fault moves during an earthquake, even if it's fairly close to horizontal, there's still going to be some vertical motion of the seafloor, and that will reduce or increase the height of the water column, and it will change the pressure at the seafloor. And these gauges are quite um, sensitive, and so they can be used to work out how much the seafloor moved. And you can see on the plot on the top right um, a, a few of these instruments and what their motions were 
at the time of this March 11th earthquake. And so you can see, relative to the motion before the earthquake, it's really quite distinct and quite abrupt. And here the pressure has then been translated to how much the seafloor moved. And so they're then able to model that and work out again how much the fault moved, and again came up with this value of 80 metres. So this is a really important technique. These instruments are not terribly expensive. Um, they could be distributed in areas where we think there might be an earthquake. Um, and they will be really important for helping to reconstruct what happened during that event and allow us to learn more. So I think these are going to become more common in the future. So what have we learned? Um, we've learned that every earthquake generates surprises. We still have much to learn. These sorts of very large earthquakes only happen really once every decade. So we don't have too many opportunities um, to, to learn from them. Now, of course, they do bring great destruction and loss of life. But the positive is that we learn a huge amount from them and we can then use that to reduce their impact in the future. We learned how much slip can occur on one fault at one time, um, which is quite incredible. Uh, we learned that the subduction zone earthquakes can rupture much more of the fault than we thought, which increased the size of the earthquake and the tsunami. And I think we've also learned how important it is to have instruments on the seafloor, just in case, to record what happens. So I'll leave you with a lovely sunset over the ocean. Um, thank you for hopefully enjoying this short lecture. Um, I hope that you choose to study geology, geophysics, geoscience, environmental geoscience, one of these subjects. They're fantastic. It's amazing to learn about how the Earth operates um, and the impacts it has on our lives on Earth and vice versa. So I hope you choose to take it as a subject and hopefully choose to come to Southampton. <laughs>